Hey, my name is Lewis, and I have the wonderful joy of being part of the student team here at the church. So I've been asked to bring um, the verse this morning, or the chapter, um, and we're going into Nehemiah 4. Um, I'm just going to read the Bible verse before John comes up and preaches. So I believe it will be on the screen behind me as well, but if you um, want to get into your Bibles, we're going into Nehemiah 4. When Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what they are building, even a fox climbing up on it would break down their walls of stones. Hear us, our gods, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insult in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their hearts. But when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs of Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up against it. But we prayed to our gods and posted the guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemy said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them, and we'll kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the, pe the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your families, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other, and each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and workers by day. Neither I, nor my brothers, nor my men, nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon, even when he went for water. Well, let's give Lewis a round of applause for that, I think. <laughs> these people reading these chapters are just amazing. So thank you so, so much. Well, Nehemiah chapter 4. And today we're talking about how to handle opposition, how to handle opposition in our lives. You know, when we think about the future church, the reality is, is we live in a post-Christian society. We are, and we looked at this when we went through the book of Daniel, we are a people in exile. And so therefore, we are a people, as followers of Jesus, who are living life on the margins of society in terms of our values 
and what we believe in. Uh, therefore, the reality is, is that we're going to have to deal with opposition. Every single follow of Jesus deals with opposition, but I believe this is only going to increase, and therefore, uh, we need to get prepared, and we need to get equipped on how to handle uh, opposition. Here's the reality. When any of us step out to rebuild and to restore for the sake of the king and his kingdom, for the sake of Jesus, there will be opposition. Like we see here, when people commit to doing something significant for God, you will always encounter opposition. And um, this may sound really obvious, but how many of us slip into forgetfulness when it comes to opposition? How many of us live with a daily theological conviction that we will face opposition of all sorts and every kind every single day? The reality is, friends, life is difficult, isn't it? Life is difficult. Life includes pain. Following Jesus is tough. Following Jesus is tough, and particularly in our culture. And when we realize that and just remind ourselves of that, it does a couple of things. I think the first thing is it prepares us. We recognize that because life is tough, life is hard, is that we can recognize it when it happens. We're not surprised by it. And the reality is being surprised by pain and suffering and difficulty and opposition actually does something to us where maybe we take on pain more than we actually should. Suffering becomes less of a tattoo and more of a wound when we realize that pain exists, opposition exists, it's part of life. And I think it's an uphill battle for some of us who have been brought up, I think, in the charismatic church because we've been sold a lie that when you come to Jesus, everything is perfect. Now, how many of you have been following Jesus and found that not to be true? Put your hand up and look around. <laughs> Life is full of trials. Just uh, check my household yesterday. <laughs> there are three enemies that we face in life. Three enemies. The world the flesh, and the devil. The world is a result of the fall, the fallenness of humanity, the broken systems that we experience, the injustices that we encounter is all part and parcel of us living in a fallen world, the brokenness that we experience. Look at the natural disasters. We live in a world that is fallen, and we're part of a system which is often unfair. Just look at the, the economy and what we're experiencing, not just in our country, but worldwide. There is an injustice there when we think about our broken systems, broken governments. We live in a fallen world. Also the flesh. We're not Gnostic. We don't believe that our bodies are bad. But... The flesh is talking about our desires, and when our desires don't line up with God's desires, they're outside of his best for us and his will for our lives, then that is the flesh. It basically means where our desires are disordered. They're out of sync of what he wanted and created. And thirdly, the devil, our enemy, Satan, who essentially primarily does this, he deceives. He deceives us. He is a liar. He twists truth. He has come to steal and to kill and destroy. And that includes me and includes you and includes your marriage and your reputation and your character and your health and your kids. And he essentially goes about these things doing two things, accusing and tempting. On the one hand, you'll find that he accuses, and on the other hand, you find that he tempts us. And so therefore, in saying that, the bottom line is, is that we are actually at war. 
we are involved in a war. And in our westernized worldview of Christianity, it's really, really easy to slip into a Satanless, uh, warless, powerless gospel and understanding of life. It's really easy, isn't it? Just to the first thing that happens is that we look for a natural solution for those problems. And it's interesting, though, to me that people who actually don't believe in God have a strong belief in the supernatural. So it's kind of odd for me. I, I speak to a lot of people, agnostic or atheist, who have no problem believing in the supernatural. And yet for Christians, which this should be our norm in terms of our understanding and experiences, we kind of distance ourselves from these things. For the Christian, we should be comfortable with understanding these things, that spiritual warfare is a huge reality in our lives. You cannot possibly understand the world that we read about or we listen to, we experience regarding crimes, teenage suicide, horrendous abuse, the various wars that are happening. We cannot understand what is going on outside the church, let alone what we experience from inside the church. Battles between churches, the unrest in the church, heresy in the church. You can understand what is going on in your life and your family without setting it against the backdrop of what the Bible calls spiritual warfare. And what do we mean by that is this great cosmic battle between God and his angels and Satan and the demons that follow his lead. Just look at the mass shooting we read about in Thailand this week. Just to say that is just part of life and there is no spiritual forces of evil behind such a thing, a tragedy. That's just one thing of many that is happening all across our world. And when we see our world and we see our lives against this backdrop in terms of spiritual warfare, the reality is, is that life actually makes a lot more sense. We're able to understand things a lot more. That there are casualties, there is a, a need to fight, there is a need for weapons and an urgency and pep talks and we need to be aware of the tactics and the strategies of the enemy. This again should be the norm. And the, the narrative of the Bible has no problem with this and no problem with evil and the personification of evil through such things as systems, broken systems and people and governments and economies. And I find it fascinating that the Bible actually never defends itself. There's a lot of it we read in the Bible and people say to me, particularly with people who have no faith, why doesn't Jesus, why doesn't the Bible talk explicitly about this particular thing or subject? And the reality is we have to understand the worldview and the context of how we read the Bible is a lot of it is assumed. It automatically asserts that God and Satan exist and psychological Arguments are woefully lacking when it comes to the, the horrors that we see in our life, the genocide, the oppression. And there are two foundational scriptures in the New Testament, just to kind of lay this as a foundation. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says this, In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his scheme. So it's really important, church, that we are aware of the state the, the, the tactics, the schemes, the strategies, the ways Satan moves. And secondly, Ephesians 6, 12. And again, this should be very comforting for us. And we should always have this as a reminder. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. How many of you have had issues with people of late? It may be in the church. It may be at work. It may be with some... Neighbours, there's my son just causing chaos. This is opposition. 
And it's weird, I mean, honestly, this has been like the hardest talk to put together this week. Every time I've come to it, it's just been, um, well, horrendous. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We don't fight against flesh and blood. So stop trying to get into arguments and battles with people when it's actually not flesh and blood, but principalities and power. And we tend, as Christians, to either overestimate this. So, you know, you're going down the motorway. This has happened to me lots of times. And you've run out of petrol or your tire has got flat and you start rebuking Satan. <laughs> right. No, you just didn't put any petrol in when you saw the light and you thought you could get away with it because you're a Christian. <laughs> and Jesus is on my side. You just didn't pump up your tires and look after them. No, we don't want to overestimate, but I think actually our biggest problem is underestimating Satan. That great, deep, rich theological film, The Usual Suspects. It says this, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he didn't exist. Now, I'm excited to talk to you through Nehemiah 4 about this today because this is actually a really bad day for the enemy. A really bad day when we start to understand how he operates so that we can be aware of his tactics and we can fight and we can be victorious and flourish in our lives. One thing the enemy hates is being exposed. And C.S. Lewis's book, The Screwtape Letters, is a fantastic book to really understand this. And one of the quotes in there is this, I have great hopes that we shall learn in due course how to emotionalize and mythologize their science to such an extent that what is, in effect, a belief in us, though not under that name, will creep in while the human mind remains closed to belief in the enemy. So Nehemiah 4 helps us twofold. Helps us firstly to understand our enemy's strategies. There is nothing new under the sun about how Satan works. They're completely and utterly predictable. And secondly, we need strategies how to overcome and deal with it. So there's just the two things I want to do today. So in Nehemiah 4, verse 1, they're rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And guess what? The enemy is stirred. The enemy, I have found, only tends to attack those who are actively taking his territory and ground. He's not interested in people who aren't doing anything for the kingdom. If your life feels really comfortable right now, I would suggest maybe the question is, is what is going on with my relationship with Jesus? Because he's very, very perturbed about people who are on fire for Christ and the gospel and the extension of his kingdom. If you come on fire for Christ, look out. And the name Satan means adversary. He's committed to opposing God and his people. But as long as we live with one foot in say, the church and one foot in the world, living according to both the world's values and for the world's goals, Satan will not trouble you. And do you know what? We can go to church and we can pray and we can read our Bible and actually he won't mind. But the minute that we wake up from our spiritual apathy and lethargy and shake off that worldly mindset, and commit ourselves to a radical obedience to Christ, we will encounter spiritual opposition in our lives. Now, just as a backdrop to this, I've always found this to be a helpful and healthy perspective that without an enemy, our present is always permanent. So God actually, in his sovereignty, allows and uses, and we see this in the Bible, and we definitely could testify this to our Christian walk, he allows the enemy to 
bring that sense of opposition in our lives, but what that does is actually make us more dependent on God. Have you ever discovered that when your back is against the wall, suddenly we find the Bible. Suddenly we find speaking in tongues again. Suddenly we find the name of Jesus is useful again. Suddenly we're turning to the book of Revelation and starting to quote some things at the enemy. Suddenly there's a fight. There's like, we, we sh- we're getting out of that comfort zone that is so easy to slip into as Christians. The historian Will Duran observed this, Rome remained great as long as she had enemies who forced her to unity, vision, and heroism. When she had overcome all her enemies, she flourished for a moment and then began to die. Opposition kept Rome strong. Opposition actually helps us remain focused and dependent on God. So that's just a, something in parenthesis. Sam Ballot, we see here, the governor of Samaria, he became, verse 1 and 7, furious and angry. The Hebrew word there means burning mad. So he was burning mad at the rebuild. A secure and independent Jerusalem would threaten his hold on the area and would actually undermine his control as a trade route through the region and therefore, interestingly, hurting the economy. A lot of this always comes back to money. Note the Bible says not money is the root of all evil, but the love of money. Jesus said we can't serve two masters We must serve one or the other. And so in anger over what Nehemiah was doing, they all came together, threatening to stop the work by violence if necessary. And here we see a few things of the enemy strategy and that is nothing new about it. And we all face opposition through people who do, I think, these things. First of all, verse 1 and 7, as we said, pure outrage and Anger. This is almost like the initial affront. You start dealing with people who are op- the opposition, as you will find there will be an outrage. There will be fits of anger at what is going on. Then it's like the enemy moves to a secondary tactic. If we hold our ground there, you'll find verse 1 to 3 essentially is a ridicule and a belittling and a mocking. I don't want to do a passage, I don't want to expose here on, um, expose it here on uh, deliverance, but I've found that when I do deliverances, is often the first thing you've got to deal with is a demon that is mocking the deliverance. I've had, peop- I've had demons impersonate me. It's kind of funny uh, at the beginning of it, but then you've got to deal with it and get serious. But that's often what happens. You've got to arrest that, you've got to cast that out, you've got to deal with that. And so mocking, belittling, ridiculing, essentially anger moving to undermining. That's what the opposition will always try and do in our lives, try and undermine us. And then we see in verse 11, create noise. Now for us, let's go from Nehemiah 4 to maybe social media, because I'm sure that's what God was thinking when he allowed Nehemiah 4 to be in here. But it's so easy, isn't it, to create an army of people and a popular opinion that creates noise. And the goal of that is to intimidate you and to cause you to shrink back. And of course, it's really easy to do. Keyboard warriors never have to look at someone in the eyes. Just do it on their own, on a laptop. There's no substance ever to this. It's kind of like the way I look at it is when this stuff happens, it's, it's kind of like you're walking down a road and there's these barking, loud rock violas either side, but they're on chains. Often won't ever touch you, but there's just the noise and it's intimidating, but there's no substance to it. And so often this is a huge campaign we're experiencing at the moment as regards um, social media. It's really easy to draw up attention to yourself, draw up um, a noise, an amplification. 
That's what the enemy often does is he'll turn up the volume. And that's why we always need to get back to truth. Understand exactly what God says. And so we see here creating noise, drawing popularity, verse 8. And, you know, this is no surprise. Verse 2 and the end of verse 2 talks about the sacrifices. Of course, people will go after your personal faith. And that often sadly happens in the church. Is that people will be critical or undermine you by saying, well, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. And essentially that is a religious spirit. And a religious spirit, like a, what we see in the Pharisees, is such a strong, oppressive, legalistic spirit. And the idea of that is, is to contain us and to cause us to be undermined and intimidated. Now the goal here we see in these, these, these verses is that the enemy always wants to discourage you. That's what he is looking to do. That's what opposition is trying to do, is to discourage you, is to wear you out. Just think about it with those great football teams. Think right now, I'm a Liverpool fan, which isn't great at the moment. But I look at a team like Manchester City, and the reality is they get defeated, the opposition, because they're worn out. They just give up. They're just like, I, we cannot keep up with you guys, the way you move and the way you pass and the, your tactics and formations and the quality. We just, we're just done. And so it's like surrender through submission. It's surrender through tiredness. And so it exhausts you. It wears you out. It's what I call the wearing out tactics of Satan. Which is plain wears you out so you have no fight, you have no energy, no passion to go again. And this is primarily, I believe, what the enemy does is he brings accusation, intimidation, undermining, anger, to bring a point of fear. And then we see in verse 10, Look at that. The strength of the laborers is giving out, is failing. So these guys, they started off in great enthusiasm. And is that like for, for us who first became Christians? When you first became a Christian, you were so on fire for Jesus. You couldn't get enough of the Bible. You couldn't get enough of attending church. You were always sharing your faith. You found that you were just kind of, you know, I didn't want to get drunk anymore. You don't want to swear anymore. Just, just, just this amazing thing is happening. You're just getting cleaned up. And then over time, because you, we're not aware, we're not discipled in the wearing out tactics of Satan. It might be five years, 10 years, 20 years, and you're just worn out. And you just think, you know what? I've tried this Christian thing out. Now I'm going to do it my own way. Go my own way and just give up on God. We find it so, so often in church life. And so we see here, don't we, in verse six, they built half the wall really, really quickly. But the wearing out tactics of Satan kicked in when initial enthusiasm wanes. So Satan knows that the halfway point in any work is the most effective time to strike. Leave you alone and then just at that halfway point, when your guard is down, that is often when he strikes. So I want to encourage you to be aware of this. And this all culminates, doesn't it, in really negativity. And we see this a lot in life. Chapter 4, verse 12. The negativism came from the Jews themselves who lived near the enemy. This is really, really interesting. These people were not involved in the rebuilding of the wall. That is significant. But they lived near the enemy and were constantly exposed to his negative attacks on the work. And so they weren't personally involved in the rebuild and yet they were constantly hearing the negativity from the opposition. And so they came repeatedly, 10 times 
It's a Hebrew expression meaning over and over. They kept on coming to warn Nehemiah and those working in the wall, they will come up against us from every place when you may turn. This comes from often well-meaning Christians who hear negativity. They hear gossip. They hear rumor and whispers. And yet, you always find they're actually not involved at all with the rebuild of anything. This is so, so subtle, but we need to be aware of it. I'm like, are they giving? No. Are they serving? No. Are they sharing their faith? No. Are they at the prayer meetings? No. And yet they have an awful lot to say. I don't see that, say that in like a, a judgmental way. I'm saying it's just a scheme of the enemy that people, if we're not careful, can get around that negativity and that toxic nature and the reality is that they've lost all sense of reality about actually your job is to build your part of the wall in the unity of everyone building the wall. And so we mustn't give in to negativity from people who actually aren't on the front lines. And we must guard against this mentality. Now, there's some ideas of the tactics that the enemy will often use in terms of opposition. So we're going to be aware of it. Now, here's some strategies to overcome in Nehemiah chapter 4. Number one, I've kind of alluded to this, just be aware. So ignorance, naivety is the greatest weapon the enemy has. Just for us to gloss over it, just to be unaware of what's going on, that will be his number one strategy. So we just need to be aware. That's just a, I think we can all do that, can't we? Let's just be aware. Let's just take on board some of the things that have been talked about this morning. Secondly, verse four, pray. Did you notice that? Pray. Don't engage. Don't defend. Don't get drawn in to the opposition's tactics. The whole point of the enemy's tactics was to draw them in. And I love, and we see this throughout the Bible, but the first thing they do is pray. They pray. And I love this because if you read this, isn't it just such a real prayer? It's like an honest prayer. It's like, you know, this is, this is the situation. We're, 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 we're despised. God, do something. It's a prayer for God to rule and reign over his enemies, for God to arise above the enemies. And so we understand, yeah, we must work and we must be proactive, but a big part of this is when we encounter opposition is that we immediately pray. Go straight to God. And if if you find that difficult just on your own, not just... We have our corporate prayer meetings, but also just find one or two people and just say, look, can can we pray through this together? Can you pray for me? I'm really struggling. Do that with your spouse. It was about a year ago I was, and, and I've talked about this, so I won't repeat, but I was really in the depths of spiritual warfare experiencing all the things that I've just unpacked. And uh, uh, some of that I had to deal with through others praying for me, but particularly my wife. She would literally spend all night sitting up praying for me and seeding for me. At one time, I'm pretty sure I had a deliverance. It was pretty loud. I don't think the kids heard. But um, it was real. The battle was real. And we need to get serious about this. And we need people to intercede for us. But the first thing we must always do is turn to God. And I know that sounds obvious. It's like Christians, yeah, we pray about it. But do we? When we experience these things, opposition, are we going to prayer? And I'm most thankful for people. The first thing they do is to come and pray. Can we just pray? Can we just give this to Jesus? He rules, he reigns. 
He knows, he sees. Third thing is verse nine, stand guard. Notice that they prayed to God, but they also didn't just leave it to God, they posted a guard day and night. And so I think the principal thing is, if we're gonna overcome and have a strategy to overcome, we must learn to guard against the enemy. It talks about in the book of Ephesians, not to give the devil a foothold. In other words, this, don't leave the back door ajar to the enemy. You go to sleep at night, and hopefully the first thing you do before you go to bed is to check all your doors and make sure they're locked. Otherwise, what happens? You may have a break-in. And all it takes, you can lock 10 out of the 11 doors but leave one ajar or 10 out of the 11 windows and it leave a window open. That's how the enemy works. So we need to guard against the enemy. Stand guard against the entry points. And the way those entry points are left open is through sin. Sin is what opens up the way. And so what we need to do is to really think about our lives and to think about our home environment, to think about where we do life and think about where have I left and ask Jesus to show you where have you left, where have I left entry points, where have I left areas in my mind, my conversation, my emotions, unchecked, giving room to anger and bitterness, resentment, Where have I left a door ajar for the enemy to come in? And, you know, if you sing into a piano, the notes will reverberate. And that's what the enemy does. He simply reverberates what is already in our hearts. And that's why the first thing we should do as Christians is to guard against, to guard our hearts to guard against these entry points and to spend our days saturating our mind with things that are good and pleasing and holy and excellent and praiseworthy. Saturate our minds with God's word. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. Fourthly, vision. Verse 14, I love that. Now, having done all this, there's a language of like a general or a leader giving a rallying cry not to give up, to keep going to not be afraid, to remember who the Lord is. He is great. He is awesome. It's why we're doing this. The enemy will always try to steal your why. Always try to steal the why of what you're doing. And therefore, it's really important that we keep vision front and center. Keep focus front and center. That is, first and foremost, Jesus Christ, by reading his word, by knowing and understanding who he is by his word. And then also the why. What has God called you to do? Because the enemy will always try to dis- discourage you and cause an apathy and an atrophy in your spiritual muscles to keep going and persevering. So Nehemiah stirs them up and says, look, keep going. Do not be afraid doesn't matter what they throw you, do not be afraid. Why? Because God is awesome. God is sovereign. God is in charge. Keep your eyes fixed upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. That is how Jesus persevered on the cross. And finally, I'll finish with this. Unity, not separation. Verse 19, notice it says that the work is spread out. But then it says this, when you hear the trumpet, come together. 
hear the trumpet come together. In other words, they were doing their own thing, but it was so important because they were spread out in the rebuilding that they did it together. So they had a sound, sound of the trumpet. And I'd like to suggest to you that is the gathering of God's people. As we gather together, we may not hear church bells. Maybe we should get a church bell on this modern warehouse. How about that, eh? But when the bell goes, when the trumpet is called, when Ben plays that C note, <laughs> I'm no musician, we're all gathered together in unity and saying, yeah, we've been out and about this week doing our own thing, facing opposition, but we're here to encourage one another in the Lord. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together. Come together as the trumpet sounds, and that helps us to recognize that we're doing this together, that we're covering each other's back. It's like that spiritual armor that we place on, the armor of God, that our backs aren't covered. Why? Because we've got each other. Yes, God has our back, but also we've got each other. Helping each other, encouraging one another. Everybody doing their bit. Notice in verse 22 and 23 and verse 16, some getting water, some getting weapons, others building, others sleeping, others doing this and others doing that. They're not doing it on their own. They're doing it in unity, which is why unity is something so precious to Jesus. That is why unity is always something to be cherished in the body of Christ. And the enemy will always go after the unity of the body of Christ. Always try and divide so he can conquer. And I'm so thrilled, I'm so happy that one of the great things I see about this church is that we have a unity. There's a love, there's a relationship between us, there's a focus that we're here for Jesus and the extension of his kingdom and to welcome our city home and this is what we're about. We're not gonna get caught up into secondary and tertiary issues and arguments. We're just not gonna go there. We're not gonna have friendly fire, but we're gonna look out for each other, encourage one another, bless one another until the day comes when Christ will bring us all together in that amazing last resurrection.